Okay, continuing. Uh, Josh McDowell's list and other lists include James, the brother of Jesus, in the group of apostles who, it is claimed, would not have died for a lie. Of course, if the Gospels are to be believed, Jesus' brother James was not among Jesus' twelve apostles, nor was he among the larger group of people who followed Jesus during his lifetime. In fact, the Gospels repeatedly say that Jesus' brothers in particular and his family in general didn't believe in him. For example, John 7, 5 says, even his own brothers did not believe in him. Uh, according to the Gospel of Mark, in the wake of Jesus taking to a mountaintop to select apostles who would, among other things, quote, have authority to expel demons, uh, Jesus' family showed up to collect him because they feared he'd gone. Mark 3.21, when his family heard of this, they came to take charge of him, saying, he is out of his mind. What an exceedingly odd thing for a family that would have known the highly unusual circumstances of Jesus' birth, what angels had told Mary and Joseph about who Jesus was, and the rest. But I digress. Um, none of the Gospels, or any New Testament text for that matter, describes a scene in which James converts to faith in his brother Jesus. Um, James is not present in any of the post-resurrection eating and drinking scenes with the apostles. Um, Paul alone claims that the risen Jesus, quote, appeared to James. No details of the appearance are provided. It's worth noting that if the Gospel of Matthew is to be believed, uh, merely seeing the risen Jesus wasn't enough by itself to inspire faith. Uh, Matthew describes a scene in which the risen Jesus appears to and speaks with the eleven apostles on the top of a mountain. According to Matthew 28, 17, while all of this was going on, quote, some doubted. So seeing Jesus alive after his execution didn't always do the trick, at least according to Matthew. In any case, in one of the earliest of the canonical Christian writings, uh, namely Paul's letter to the Galatians, James, the brother of Jesus, is described as an apostle and as one of the pillars of the early church. Um, I suspect the primary reason James, the brother of Jesus, shows up on the list of apostles who wouldn't have died for a lie is because Christian apologists believe that James' martyrdom is attested to by a non-Christian historian. We'll explore that problematic belief a bit later. Caveat E. Uh, tell me where in the world is... The Apostle Paul. Josh McDowell's list does not include Paul, nor does the vast majority of lists I looked at in preparing for this series. Why? Well, it seems Paul's purported encounters with the risen Jesus do not satisfy the criteria for inclusion in the wouldn't die for a lie group. Let's listen to Lee Strobel's description once more. The disciples in all of history were in a unique position. They didn't just believe sincerely that Jesus returned from the dead. They were in a position to know for a fact. They touched him. They ate with him. They talked with him. They knew this wasn't a trick or hallucination. They knew the truth. And knowing the truth, they were willing to die for it. As Acts 10.41 says, when we're talking about this group, we're talking about those, quote, who ate and drank with Jesus after he arose from the dead. Um, those who, it is claimed, saw and interacted with a physically resurrected Jesus. What does the Bible claim Paul saw? Well, in the ninth chapter, of Acts, Paul's encounter with Jesus is described as follows, quote, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice. Um, Acts has Paul described the scene twice more, while the subsequent accounts, particularly the last of them, seem embellished, uh, they contain the same basics about what Paul purportedly saw. Acts 22, 6 to 11 has Paul say, quote, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice. Um, he goes on to say, quote, I could not see because of the brightness of that light. Acts 26, 13 to 19, has Paul say he saw, quote, a light from heaven brighter than the sun 
shining all around me, and I heard a voice. Uh, the passage has Paul add for the first time that Jesus spoke to him, quote, in the Hebrew dialect. Uh, some translations have it as Aramaic, others as the Hebrew language. Anyway, in verse 19, Paul calls the whole thing a, quote, heavenly vision. Uh, there are no indicia of Paul having the sort of physical encounter with the risen Jesus that the Gospels and Acts describe the 11 remaining apostles having with the risen Jesus. No eating, drinking, touching, and the rest. Uh, therefore, Paul is not on the list. By the way, according to Acts, Paul experienced a number of visions of Jesus. My personal favorite is in Acts 22, 17 to 18, which says Paul was praying in the temple in Jerusalem and he, quote, fell into a trance, unquote, and saw Jesus speaking to him. No doubt Christians would quickly dismiss as silly talk of trances and visions from a non-Christian religious figure, but they enthusiastically embrace the very same thing from prominent figures in their own faith tradition. Caveat F, F for finally. Um, finally, I must mention the various women who purportedly saw and interacted with the physically resurrected Jesus. Uh, we know nothing about the circumstances of their deaths, so they're not included here. Okay, so we have our list of people who, it is claimed, would not have died for a lie. Let's get to work on it. There are at least three problems with the they wouldn't die for a lie argument. Number one, the argument ignores the tremendous and demonstrated power of cognitive or psychological dissonance management among religious believers. Number two, the argument doesn't seem to be rooted in or consistent with Christian scriptures. Uh, number three, the argument has little, if any, meaningful evidence to support it. I'll take each of these in turn. Okay, point number one, the argument ignores the tremendous and demonstrated power of cognitive dissonance management among religious believers. After over half a century of research and study, one of the best established facts about religious believers is that when they experience a disappointment with respect to their religious beliefs, especially, ironically enough, a significant disappointment, for example, the failure of a major prophecy, um, believers tend to be driven to neutralize the cognitive or psychological dissonance caused by such a disappointment and find a means of reestablishing cognitive consonance without sacrificing their religious beliefs. There's a ton of literature on this, but the best I've seen is an article entitled When Prophecy Fails and Faith Persists, a theoretic, theoretical excuse me, overview, uh, written by sociologist Lorne L. Dawson of the University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, the article was published in 1999 and is now available online for free. There's a link to the right of the screen for those interested. I strongly encourage anyone watching this to read the article. One sees the phenomenon play out over and over again in religious contexts. For example, the significant prophetic failures of Jehovah's Witnesses in 1914, 1925, and 1975 did not destroy the organization. There are still millions of Jehovah's Witnesses around the world, including people who witnessed the prophetic failures. Believers successfully navigated the disconfirmation by finding ways to reestablish cognitive consonants without sacrificing their religious beliefs. Lubavitch Hasidim puked and rallied when their Rebbe Menachem Schneerson, believed by many to be the Messiah, died in 1994. It remains one of the largest and most vibrant Hasidic sects, and a significant number of its adherents still hail the late Rabbi Schneerson as the Messiah and await his return to earth. Believers successfully navigated the disconfirmation by finding ways to reestablish cognitive consonants without sacrificing their religious beliefs. Okay, I'll pick this up in part four.